We pray as we have all the way through that God has been glorified and will be again by the things that are said here this evening. We pray that everyone here has been uplifted in some way by the time that we have spent together in God's Word. And I pray again that that would be true tonight. But let me remind you one more time that if there's someone here tonight that's been thinking about being baptized into Christ, I want to tell you, you'll never make a better decision, and we pray that you'll do that even tonight. If there's someone here that knows that they're not living the way that God will want them to live, and you realize that there is a matter of repentance that you need to make in your life, we pray that you'll do that. If you need to do it privately, we pray that you will. If it's something that you need to do before the church and ask their forgiveness and their prayers, we pray that you will do that also. For those of you that may be new in the faith or maybe be struggling, we pray tonight that you will be encouraged. We pray for you, those of you that are strong in the faith that you will be renewed again. And I appreciate the emphasis our song leaders have put on the songs and, reading, and leading those that have to do with revival as was tonight. And as you know, that is our theme and has been throughout our time together. So tonight we continue a little farther thinking about revival. And tonight I want to tell you that I'm proud to be an American. And when I say that, I really mean that, but I'm also very proud to be an American for a lot of reasons, and just a few of those would be, I'm, I'm so glad to have the freedoms that we enjoy and the privileges, and I pray every day. In fact, the Bible tells us to do just that. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, he said, I, I desire first of all that supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. So we need to always pray for those that are over us that we might continue to enjoy the freedoms that we do and that the gospel might have free course in our nation. I'm so thankful tonight because we have the many privilege that, privileges that we do. I'm not a world traveler. I've been a few places out of the country, but not like probably some of you. I imagine some of you have traveled far more than I have. But I'll tell you this, of the places I've ever gone, there's nowhere I had rather live than right here in the United States of America. I believe that God has blessed America, no doubt in my mind. We have so many wonderful things for which we are to be thankful and easily taken for granted if we're not careful. So let us be mindful of the fact that we have every good and every perfect gift from above, and God gives us those things. But tonight, I want to ask the question, or at least raise the question, Will God continue to bless America? I believe that we live in a day that I see more concern among God's people, wondering will God continue to bless us the way that we are going in our country. And I think tonight I want to address that to some degree. I probably won't cover everything there is to be said about this, but this is what I want us to deal with for the next few minutes here tonight. Will God continue to bless America? There's a, a guy by the name of uh, Twigville, if you want to say it in the French, and I probably didn't get it right, but it's something like that. You probably have seen this quote before. But he did. He was a political scientist, a science major from France, and he did a lot of work thinking about what was going on in America. And he said, America is great because she is good. If America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. As we think about that tonight, I want us to begin with a text. If you got your Bibles, let me see them. All right, turn with me to Romans chapter 1, and let's read a few verses together. Romans chapter 1, I'm going to take up in verse 18, and read these powerful words of Paul. And actually, he's talking about a nation that has turned its back on God. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, I'm reading from the New King James Version. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, and the lusts of their hearts to 
to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves a penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God and those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Again, the idea here is a picture of a society that has turned its back on God. As I observe this, I see what probably you see as well. And that is, we could almost take this and apply it to America and say that we see some of these very same things in our society today. And we learn that just as God turned them over to things that were not good, we learn that it was because of his displeasure because of their moral decline. This is not the only time. When you back up to a passage like Leviticus chapter 18, we learn there that God is telling his people before they uh, get in and actually well, while they're in the promised land, he said, now listen, I want you to know that there are some things I will not tolerate because there were nations that lived here before you. And because of their immorality, I had the land to vomit them out. And he talked about things like sacrificing their children to Moloch. And it's hard for us to believe what they did. But we learned that there is this image that they had that was made out of bronze that was hollow. And they would set fire under that thing. And they would get it blazing hot. And the people would go out there that wanted to sacrifice their children. And they'd go up and then the priest would throw these babies onto the arms and just sear them and kill them almost instantly. But they yet they saw that as being something they were doing and honoring a God. I wonder when we think about several or a few thousand, I should say today, babies that lost their lives at the hands of an, of an abortionist. I wonder if God doesn't look at that in pretty much the very same way. And as we think about the immorality that is going on in our world, the very same thing was said in Leviticus 18. And God said, if you engage in those kinds of things, just like the land vomited out those that were doing these things beforehand, it will vomit you out too. That's why when we see the things that are about us, we raise the question, will God continue to bless America? What has led to the state of moral decline that we are in in our day and time? I suppose the list would be far too long for us to elaborate on everything tonight. But I want to bring out some of the bigger things that we see and some of the things that I think even in our many of our lifetimes that, that have happened, that have led to the moral decay that we're in right now. In 1962, there was a ruling by the Supreme Court of our land that said no longer are we going to allow prayer in school. I remember when I first started school, which was in 1962. Of course, I, I started when I was really young. But when we started there in 1962, I can remember it was a daily practice that our teacher had us to get somebody to get up and have a Bible reading, and we would have a prayer. But yet we learned in 1962 that the highest authority in our land, the Supreme Court, said you can't do that legally anymore. And although there are a lot of us that were against that, and we thought it was a bad thing, and it is a bad thing, any time you take God out of anything, you're always headed for trouble. Because righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to anyone. 
And we learned that when we take God out of anything, we're always headed for trouble. There have been a lot of people that have looked at the morality of our young people since 1962. And usually when we think about charts, we usually think that charts kind of go up, and they may dip a little bit and something like this, and usually go up. But what you see is the exact opposite of that when you see the morality of our young people since 1962. Those who have studied that, we might say, if, if here's where they start in 1962, until present date, it continually goes downhill as far as the morality of our young people. Once again, when you take God out of anything, we're headed for trouble. It fascinated me, oh, it's, it's terrible, but it fascinated me what happened in the midst of this event. Columbine was the first real school problem that caught our attention. Now, it's happened several times since, and just a few days ago, it happened again. And it's a terrible thing. But there was a bit of irony. I remember I was in a gospel meeting that particular time, and I was, in fact, studying. I came in and then turned on the, the TV, and it just happened to be on CNN. I don't usually watch CNN, but it just happened to be on there when I turned it on. And I learned about what was going on and, and saw the panic that was taking place there and, and feeling the heaviness of heart when I saw what had taken place in that school. But here's the irony. As I watched that for a few minutes, the President of the United States' face came on the screen. And guess what he was asking Americans to do? Pray for these people. And certainly that was in order. But I couldn't help but think that he is asking us to do what effectively they were not legally allowed to do just a little while before that. Again, when we take God away from anything, we're always headed for trouble. That's number one. Moving from there to 1973, I was a junior in high school on January the 22nd, 1973, when the Supreme Court made another infamous decision which was now that women could have a legal abortion on demand. There are abortions that took place before that illegally in our country. There were other places in the world that could happen for legal reasons, but, but here we learned that illegally uh, before that time in America. But in 1973, they said we're not going to have that anymore. Now we're going to say that a woman, if she desires to do so, she can have an abortion and do you know, just, just shy now to present date, I looked it up today, there's a calendar you can go and look at on the internet if you want to. We're almost up to 60 million abortions, legal abortions in the United States of America since 1973. Have you thought about that today? Probably if you're like most of us, probably not. It's been going on so long. And even if it were published in the paper every day, I don't know if we'd think about it too much. Because as we look at all the other things that are happening, we think about all the murders and all the things that are happening here and there and everywhere, it just seems like another thing that's just on top of the pile. But yet, almost 4,000. Almost 4,000, probably about 3,700 on average today. In the United States of America, babies were slaughtered at the hands of an abortionist every single day in the United States alone and done legally. It's not a dead issue, but I think a lot of us are just kind of thrown in the towel and thinking that I don't know if it'll ever change. But I'll come back to that thought in a minute. Number three, sexual immorality. I know that Jeff relates to this, and I'm not saying just because of the church here, but he's probably like I am. I get a lot of folks that come to me that are not members of the church at Killen because they kind of feel embarrassed uh, about coming to the local preacher sometimes and some of the things that are going on in their lives. But there are so many affairs that are going on in our world anymore. I heard on just a statistic on the radio the other day that said with all married couples now, at least one out of three is going to be affected by Adultery. And then something else that has developed even more, and it's not new, but it's something that's developed even more, as you and I know, and that is same-sex marriage. How many of us that are a little older would have thought 
in our teen years or in our early years of adulthood, that we would ever see that in the United States of America. But now it is legal. Judy and I were over on a campaign in American Samoa a couple of years ago, and that had just come in to law. And the first day we were there, actually we, we got in there on a Friday night, and then the next day before we really started work, and we worked hard while we were there, but they had the, the church to get together with, with some other ministers that were in the area, and we met out in a little park. It was just kind of get to know each other because we were going to be working together very closely for the next week. And as it is in a lot of island countries, the, the preachers hold quite a bit of sway. And I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just saying that's the way it is. But they were kind of out there by themselves, and they motioned me to come over. And so I went over, and they were very kind and very gracious, but they're very straightforward. They didn't mince their words. They said, Brother Dean, we want to know, is it really true that it's now legal for same-sex marriage in America? And I said, well, yes. They said, that's what we understood. Their next question, where were the Christians when all this was going on? I answered that the best that I knew how. I said, well, it wasn't like we were all asleep. There were some folks that were actively involved trying to do something. But I think for the most part, not too much. Have you ever thought how many, how many practice homosexuality here in the United States alone? That's a worldwide problem, but in the United States alone. I like to get things down on a level where I understand them. If you think about all the members of the churches of Christ, if you were to just put everybody together side by side and string us out and put, every, you know, about everywhere you go, they might not be as plentiful to, as they are in West Tennessee, but you can find a church of Christ usually somewhere in the United States wherever you go. If you were to put every one of us together and then you line up everybody that claims and in, is out there and proud of being homosexual, they would easily outnumber us about two to three to one. So it's, it's not a problem. Oh, yeah, it's a tremendous problem, and it's not getting better. Because now we're learning that our, a lot of our young people are beginning to experiment more and more. And with the Internet, there are some folks, and I've, I've run into this a few times, that young people are now reading things on the Internet, and they're kind of determining that that's what we are. Satan is so sly. I've got a statement that I use a lot. That Satan is never good, but he's always good at what he does. And this is one area where he has sold a lot of folks in America a bill of goods. Let's think about this in light of Romans chapter 1. Remember that it's talking about the men with men and the women with women and talking about doing those things which were disdained by God. And then we back up to Leviticus 18 or we can look at Leviticus chapter 20 and we learn that those things were abomination in the sight of God. Now I want to say something here. I don't think that we hate people. And I believe that anybody that's living that lifestyle, I believe that they can be forgiven. So I want you to understand that right up front. I don't think it's just a terrible worse sin than everything else. It's sin, and people can be forgiven of that. In fact, we have that very example in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, we learn that in the church at Corinth, there were some that had been practicing homosexuality, but then they said that they were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified in the blood of the Lamb. So we can be forgiven of those things, but I don't know much that's more highly charged in emotions than this particular topic. About every Sunday, maybe not every, but about every Sunday, we have people that come to church, or a few, that come to church at Killen, and I know that they're involved in homosexual activity. That doesn't mean that we accept the sin. We love the sinner. And we, condone, we condemn the sin. But we want them to know that in love. And we want to know, anybody to know, if they're living together, as many folks do in our, our day and time, that we love them. We can't love the sin. But we want them to know that there's a better way, and that is God's way. 
But yet these things have become so prevalent in our society. I'm afraid that sometimes as Christians we just kind of turn our head. We don't approve of those things, but we kind of turn our heads because it's going on so frequently in our world. Not only this, but as we move on to the next point, if you'll move me on, brother. Not only sexual immorality, but we learn there's also been a breakdown in family life. When I was a kid, isn't it amazing how things change so quickly over time? When I was a kid, if there was somebody that was going through a divorce, you remember that it wasn't talked about loudly. In fact, it was one of those things you almost whispered when you said to somebody else. But there again, it has become so commonplace to have broken families in our day and time. And I told you, we're not exempt from that either. We've got it even in, with our own kids. And it's sad and it's bad. But I'll tell you what, the people that are in the know, the people who kind of understand humankind and, and how societies work, they are telling us if we ever make a change in this world, yes, Christ will be the center of it, but if we ever turn things around, that's where it has to begin. We've got to begin with our families. We've got to have strong families, and we've got to have mamas and daddies that are committed to one another, and they stay in love, and they stay together, and they make it work, and they raise those kids and nurture and admonition of the Lord. But for so long... That hasn't been the case, and it continues to be such a terrible problem in our world. And then we come back to what I alluded to a while ago. I think another thing that has led to a great decline of morality in our world is not that churches or even Christians, for the most part, have approved of those things, but we haven't stood up to be counted. We haven't stood up to be counted. Now, I want to ask you something. I'm going to challenge you and me. I told you every sermon begins with me. When same-sex marriage was on the table in our country, I want to ask you, what did you do? What did you do to try to stop it? You know it's wrong. I know it's wrong. What did we do? I'm not saying nobody did anything, but I'm not so sure we did much. And yes, we might have had a few times when we got together to pray for it. How many letters did we send to those that are in authority? How many times did we stand up and say, this is wrong? How many times since have we stood up and said, this is wrong? When abortion came in in 1973, a long time ago, what did we do? What kind of steps did we make? What did we do to say this is wrong? God would never approve of this. And if our nation is going to stay blessed by America, we can't allow these things to go on and stay silent. It's not to say that we can change everything. But you know, God and one person always make a majority. What did we do? In 1962, when they said, well, okay, we'll take prayer out of schools now because it's not. What did we do? And I'll tell you to my shame, I didn't do much. And I say that again to my shame. I didn't do much. But if we're going to change things in our world, we need to stand up. And I'm not saying we need to bomb abortion clinics. You know that's wrong too. But I'm saying as Christians, and in a Christian way, in a loving way, we need to let this world know there's a better way of doing things than the way our world is going. And who's going to do it if we don't? Who are we going to leave it to? You think the president's going to turn things around by himself? You think all of our elected leaders, there may be a few, I don't know, but who would you go to and say, now, if anybody's in shape to do this, you, are we going to leave it to them, or are we going to do what you and I know that we need to do and stand up and be the light of this world and the salt of this earth? And if Christians don't do it, if you and I don't do it, who's going to? Who's going to? As we think about this, there is a responsibility that you and I have. Another one of the great revival passages of the Old Testament is recorded in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. Let me just very briefly put this as in its setting. Remember, David was a man of blood, so God would not allow him to build him a permanent house, would not allow him to build the temple. But he did allow his son Solomon to do it. And we know that it was a spectacular thing, and God accepted that. He, he caused his name to dwell there. 
there was this tremendous ceremony taking place, and we won't talk about all of that. But it seemed that during that time of the dedication of the temple that God anticipated, because man had always been this way, and God knows everything anyway, that man had always had a tendency to wander away from him, maybe to drift away, as we talked about last night. So God says, if that happens, then I'm going to punish you. And I'm going to bring locusts in to eat up your land. It won't rain. He'll talk about all the things he would do. And then he said, though, because he is a gracious God, if my people who are called by my name during that time will humble themselves and pray and turn their, <coughs> or seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. God has always been gracious and kind, and He's never changed. But remember, there's an if and then. If you will do this, then I will do this. Now let's bring it down to a level of thinking about where we are. I like Nehemiah. Nehemiah was one that knew that things weren't going the way they were supposed to back in the homeland. He was a cupbearer. But then when he realized that the temple wasn't being rebuilt, they'd gotten discouraged and stopped, what did he do? He hit his knees and he prayed. But he didn't say, God, I'm going to pray for those people up there. He said, God, we have sinned. God, we, talking about us, he didn't try to blame it on somebody else. He said, we are the Victims here, not the victims, we're the perpetrators here, we're the people that are causing this, and we all are responsible. You and I have to look at it the same way. You might say, well, you know those people up in Washington. Well, I don't agree with everything they do either, but we are a nation. And as Christians, we are the backbone of the nation. When God looks at the United States of America, who do you think that he looks at first? I guarantee you, he looks at his people. And he's thinking about what we do and what he expects of us and where we are. And no doubt, this world continues to stand right now because of the great patience and the mercy of God. Because why? He wants all men to be saved. That's why this world stands right now. If you don't believe that, read 2 Peter chapter 3. And we can account our salvation to the long-suffering of God. This world stands right now because of the long-suffering of God. God is in heaven waiting. But it may be that, first of all, right now, He's waiting on you and me to get our hearts and lives right. And we have to get ourselves right before we'll ever be able to help the world to get right again. Let me tell you two or three things in a very practical way. Number one, I want to challenge you, but yet I want to teach you that every day you and I need to be praying fervently. I believe in the power of prayer. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 2. We need to be praying fervently for not only our president, but for all those that are in authority that we might continue to have the freedoms that we do. And not only that, pray that they can find their wisdom in God. And if we're not praying that, we need to start right now. Number two, listen carefully. I don't want to get political, but I want you to listen carefully. There are things where God has blessed us in this country that we are allowed to do as Christians, and we need to exercise our right, and one of those is to vote. To vote. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you which party and that kind of, that's not my business. I told some of the guys the other day, we're eating together, I said, my party is the God party, the G-O-D party. And until we Christians get that in our minds and realize that morality counts more than anything else, we are still in trouble. Because I know some folks, and it doesn't matter which party you want to take, they're going to vote for whoever it is in that party. I don't care what they think, what they say, what they do, and that's not right. But you and I can make a difference. A lot of elections, and you ought to know this, a lot of elections or decisions about things, even sinful things, one vote makes all the difference. One vote. And you know that from something that has happened here. 
And if you just had two Christians that were going out there and have done the right thing, you wouldn't be having some of the problems that you are now. It's not always easy. Let me tell you something that happened to us. Didn't have to do with voting per se, but something that happened to us here just recently in our county. We have 67 Churches of Christ in Lauderdale County, Alabama. And many of those are quite large. It is said in the Shoals area, at least at one time, per capita, there were more members of the Churches of Christ than anywhere else in the nation. Now, I don't know if that still holds true or not, but it was true at one time. They said about 10,000 in the Shoals area that would claim to be members of the Churches of Christ. So the influence is pretty heavy there, as you might imagine. I'm not saying that we can do better. I'm just saying the influence is pretty heavy. But year before last, it was this time of year, high school football. And some of you know kind of how these things have played out, that you have the national mandates that are handed down. But then there was, at least in our area for a while, they said, well, we can have prayer before a football game if it is student-initiated. One man. One man got involved with freedom from religion. He stirred up a hornet's nest with some people. And because of one man, no longer is our county allowed even students to lead a prayer before a football game. But I ask the question again, where was I? Where were the Christians when these things happened? And I'll tell you what it came down to, and here's the challenge. And we're going to have to deal with it. Maybe not today, but it's coming soon, probably every one of us. Here's what it came down to. There were Christians that were very disturbed by that. And they started to counteract that legally. That's the only way you can combat these things. But they realized they were dealing with some deep pockets. And even though, even though there was a real good possibility that the Christians could have won, the physical, the monetary price would have been so high, they chose not to do it. Now you can make your judgment that was right or wrong. Satan is never good, but he's always good at what he does. Now, I think you and I are going to have to challenge ourselves to say, are we up to the challenge? Are we courageous enough? Are we strong enough? Is our faith strong enough to believe that God will be with us? And if God will be for us, who can be against us? Do we have that kind of conviction? The Lord said, if you will do this, then here's what I'll do. The principle of that, I don't believe, has ever changed. If we will do it God's way, then God will bless us in ways beyond what we even can imagine. But tonight I brought, draw this together by this particular statement. Change begins with you and with me. Too often we're sitting back waiting on somebody to do something. But what are we willing to do? There again, I'm talking about things that are right. I'm talking about godly ways and ways in love. But change begins with you and me. But we've been talking here for the last few days. If we are complacent, if we're just coming in and filling the pew, if we're just kind of walking around like zombies spiritually in this world, then we're not going to make much difference. But if we're people that are convicted, people that live what we say that we are, that we belong to Christ, and that we're about doing His work in this world, then we'll make a difference in this world too. And the challenge comes back to you and me. Are we ready to do it? Are we ready to stand up and be counted? Are we ready to tell others about Jesus? Are we ready to show them that there's a better way in this world than the way this world is going? Are we willing to say there's a better way that our nation can function? 
And if we don't turn things around and start doing things in a different way, there's a very good possibility that it's too late for America, that God may deliver us and the land may vomit us out. Do we really believe that? We do if we believe God. But to answer the question, is it too late for America? I don't know. There are times when we see that, like in the days of Manasseh, that God says, I'm going to do, let the land vomit you out. And eventually he did repent, but it's too late. I don't know. But I do know things will never change unless you and I have a change of heart. I know things will never change until we make God number one in our lives again. And that's why we have put this emphasis so much on revival. I need it. You need it. We all need it as God's people. We need to say God has to be number one. And when he is, it makes all the difference in the world. You've heard the old illustration, but let me tell it just one more time, and I'll bring this lesson to a close tonight. One time there's a guy that came home, sat down in his chair before dinner, picked up his newspaper, tired, worn out, hungry. He just wanted to have a minute to just sit there and read his paper. But he had a little boy that was so tickled to see Daddy home. And the little boy keeps running up to him, and he keeps interrupting. And, Daddy, look at this. And, Daddy, he, he's trying to get his attention because he wanted Daddy to see what he was doing. After a while, Daddy well, turned over to another page in the newspaper, which he hadn't gotten much out of anyway because the boy kept interrupting. And he saw that there was a an ad on that full page of a globe. It was the earth. And he thought, I've got an idea. So he pulled it out of the paper and he tore it into several pieces and he put it down on the floor and said, here, son. He said, i got a puzzle. I want to see if you can put this together. <laughs> he thought that'll keep him busy for a while. Started reading his paper and hadn't gotten but another paragraph or two and he said, Daddy, I'm finished. And he looked down and sure enough, the little boy had put all those puzzle pieces together, and there it was. He said, son, he said, I, I, I'm proud of you. He said, how in the world did you ever get that put together so quickly? He said, well, Daddy, he said, I found out there's a picture on man on the other, of a man on the other side, and I found out when I got the man right, the word was right. I've always liked that because that's the way it is. Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. When we, that is you and me, when we get the man right, then we can go about making the world right. I will say this before I close tonight. I do know a few people that are kind of making inroads into some of the things and knowing what's going on in government. And I hope this is encouraging to you. It is to me. Their thinking is, right now, right now, things are not perfect in government. But we have probably the best chance right now of reversing Roe versus Wade. Perhaps even overturning or reversing same-sex marriage than we've had since they have been law in this country. Nothing is impossible with God. And again, when you and I get our lives right, God always blesses his people. Yes, God has blessed us richly and continues to. But we can't expect to live in a world of sin as people who are trying to make a difference and not do anything. And God be pleased with that. But I close with this statement. You can't teach what you don't know and you can't lead where you don't go. So tonight, I hope that we'll get our hearts to say, I want to be a Christian wherever I am. I want to make a difference, not because of me, but because of what God expects of me and of you. May God help us to be the people that we should be in our world. And maybe tonight we have someone here who isn't a Christian. And this will be a great night for you to become one. 
Maybe tonight we have someone here who isn't living faithfully. You need to come home and get it right. Because you see, you can't help somebody else until you get it right in your life first. As we sing this song of encouragement tonight, if there is anyone here who is subject to the Lord's invitation, would you please come while together we stand and sing.